things are shaping up nicely. Welcome, everybody. I'm Bronwyn Knox, here with David B. Anderson and David Lawler. Tonight, we're going to be discussing the 1963 James Bond movie from Russia with Love. So how are you guys tonight? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. That's well, good. He's, he's fine. He has nothing to offer other than that. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Except my handsomeness. Yeah. You Gor- can't see through the thing. Gorgeous David Blake Anderson. David Blake, Blake yes. Blake. David Blaine. David Blaine. I'm going to levitate you, and then I'm going to eat my own head. Cool. <laughs> this is from Russia with Love. From Russia with Love. supposed to be, anyway. I found my guide for the film Fanatic, written around 1985 by Danny Peary. This book is out of print, but you can find it on Amazon used copies or copies that haven't been opened. And he starts it off, because he has all the Bond movies in the, mo- in, in the book up to A View to a Kill. And I always like to contribute a little bit of what he wrote because I learned a lot about filmmaking reading his reviews. An excellent, surprisingly tough and gritty James Bond film, the second in the series. Spectre devises a plan that result in warfare between the Soviets and the free world. They want to frame British agent James Bond, Sean Connery, for the murder of a Soviet agent, Daniela Bianchi, who has become his lover. Actually, a deadly assassin intends to kill them both. Played by Robert Shaw, a film is refreshingly free of the gimmickry that would characterize the later Bond films, and Connery and Bianchi play real people. I don't know what he means by that. We worry about them and hope their relationship will work out. I don't know if I was that worried. Shaw and Latte Lenya as the diabolical Kreb. That's the uh, that's that really scary woman that's in the movie. The scary mm-hmm. little tiny woman. Are splendid villains. Both have exciting, well choreographed fights with Connery. Actors play it straight with excellent results. The lovely Bianchi should have been a bigger star. She's one of the most appealing of the Bond heroines. Solid direction by Terrence Young, who handled the train sequence especially well. So that's what he had to say. Not too hmm. sure. I, I, I like the gimmickry. I don't know. What was... What, that, what, well, this I don't is, mind the gimmickry of later movies, but this movie's fine, too. Well, the gimmicks are, are because this is the movie that introduces the great Desmond Llewellyn, my favorite character, Q. Mm-hmm. This, is the, before, the this, is, this is before he hates him. Like this is before it becomes he hates all the things that he's, he's breaking and doing and he's everything. A, he's a oh, little, yeah. but he is a little annoyed here. He's like, this this is his first movie as Q, but he's already the actor is fifty years old, so he was already kind of a crusty old man, but he was a crusty old young man sort of. <laughs> and I was thinking about that too because I really I like the new actor that they got to play Q because he's like a young Q. You're talking about now in the Daniel Craig ones. You yeah, like the new that the new Q. kid. Mm-hmm. He's like this geek. He's like this geeky guy. He's kind of got a Richard Ayoade thing going on about him. I almost feel like they wrote the dialogue for Desmond Llewellyn, and this kid just naturally says it, you know? Well, they eased him in. They they, 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 they didn't get him in until the third uh, Craig one, actually. Yeah, yeah. There was no Q for a while. Uh, I think Q's last appearance, Desmond Llewellyn's last appearance, was World Is Not Enough. He kind of gets replaced by John Cleese. Right. Yeah, he knew, he knew it's like he knew the end was coming because he was super old and he was like, I, I don't know if I can do that. But then he died in some sort of weird. He didn't die. He just, of old age. No, yeah, he died in a car accident. Yeah. That's all. He just died in a regular car. You think he would probably have died, even though, geez, 50 years. He was 50 years old, right, for, from Rush With Love. So how many, yeah. how old would that have made them when he died? 8,000. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thousand. Close enough. Close enough math for me. This is a second Bond movie, and it's the first one to give us a little bit of a formula, right? Yeah, it starts. It starts off with the with, with it starts off with some of the familiars that you think. So that it's weird when you watch the old ones. You you think certain things are going to happen, and then they don't because you've seen so many of them, and mm. you think, oh, well, this should happen. It's like first, it does start off with the with the with the proper fanfare of the ding 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 ding, yeah, and uh, that. Yeah. Then it comes over. Then you get the stunt man. Then, then it, but then when, when the, when sort of the, the little circle open doesn't open up into the movie, it just kind of goes, nah, 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 and then it just kind of goes right to the movie. Like it doesn't, it doesn't open up to the movie. You wouldn't get to that until Thunderball, actually. It goes well. We start with, uh, I guess we're having, we got Robert Shaw, and he's doing some practice. It's kind of like the Man with the Golden Gun because mm-hmm. you have a fake James Bond. Right. I was thinking that too while watching it. I'm like, this is, uh, this, uh, well, with the James Bond movies, they would often recycle bits and just change them around just a little bit like and then it would be like a new thing somehow but it wasn't really but you didn't care just a little bit yeah when he's he's chasing like he's chasing some guy that you think is James Bond well yeah he's yeah. wearing he's wearing one of those Scooby Doo Mission Impossible masks if, you, know? if you look really <laughs> close you can kind of they almost like sort of signal it where it's like it's James Bond but he's he's walking a little funny he's got like tons of makeup on cuz you see HD mm-hmm. so it's like could be a mask or well, something. that I didn't notice, but it was Sean Connery, right, playing his. Oh, double. it was Sean Connery. Yeah, it's just that Most he's wearing like, tons of makeup, and you can kind of tell. So it's like he was, he was like he was James Bond, but he wasn't. 
right. and then of course you got you got uh you know he he strangles and it's only like one minute forty two seconds or something he strangles him and, and then he takes the mask off and that would and, that wouldn't actually happen ever with with the real James Bond he would not he oh. does because we do we, he does try later on but we'll get to that when we get to it so then we get the opening titles with but no as you pointed out no cool theme song in this still one. no theme song <laughs> but there is a theme it's song instrumental. At the end. It's, it's instrumental. The first two's were instrumentals. It's uh, it's like a bunch of bodies with with the titles projected onto them this time, so you don't have the animated bodies dancing like you did with. Um, Robert Brownjohn did this, not not uh, Morris Bender. He did the he did this, and he did Goldfinger. Right, and Goldfinger Goldfinger gets us closer even more yeah. to how we begin to look at the titles as mm -hmm. as, as they evolve throughout the the series. But this is another. This is a variation. Oh, and don't forget uh, the, the guy that takes the mask off, and when it comes off, it goes. It makes a noise. <laughs> um, I didn't. It's, that's lovely. That's gross. <laughs> Walter Walter Gotell as not Gogol. As not Gogol, he plays like uh, he plays uh, somebody named Morzini, Morzini, a mm -hmm. Spectre th thug. This again continues the whole thing with with Spectre, because then we got you know I mentioned Lottie Lenya, and mm -hmm. um, the other guy, the really ugly dude. It's a really ugly dude that that she was with who winds up biting it at the end. I forget his name. Hmm, I can't remember the character's name. Oh, it was uh, Vladek Schlebel <laughs> as Kronstein. Kronstein. Playing, that's playing and, they, and, he's, and he's there playing. You know, I just realized something. The first two start with people playing chess. I just hmm. realized this. I that's just right. That's right. The men were guys playing chess. When and the three blind mice them. guys came over with their oh, guns, yeah. they were breaking up a chess game. And then they're and playing chess in this one. It was like a big, with the a huge, big chess game. The huge a, chess game. And this and one, was, well, this one doubles the budget though, two uh, million from one. Look, like, when I looked at that, I'm like, that's either some, some really good set design with no money, or this is partially a, a I think partially it's a match shop. But I'm well, like, I, there, well, there's yeah, good production design in this. Plus, they they take it, they they go bigger with it than they would in Doctor No. Doctor No mainly, I think the set design was was in Doctor No's island his secret island at crab key and the first shot of like this the specter logo which is sort of the the octopus it's an sort octopus of thing. yes your yeah. your presence is required or something i remember I, I told you that i was i noticed that the um the specter logo and the shield logo are almost identical the specter logo is an octopus and if you look at the logo closely i think that the points where the tentacles meet are supposed to be the uh, the members of specter the the Kronstein is a uh, he he gets a message in his drink or on the bottom of his drink telling him, you you know hey we're having a meeting get over here so he goes over there and and then we're we're introduced sort of but not quite yet, to the leader of um, of Spectre uh, playing Blofeld and it says Blofeld in the credits but it, it, there's a question mark there I don't know why they kept the identity secret it's a guy with a voice we'll see eventually you would have like the big reveal of Blofeld and you only live twice right um, and that's where, Donald Pleasance though right Donald Pleasance but Donald Pleasance actually replaced the original Blofeld who they said like look, look like Father Christmas or something and Father they Christmas. <laughs> after two days what well, was, was scary yeah, they had, but they had two people. Uh, one was the, they needed the body so the body that they could pet the cat, and then they had the voice. And Brown was thinking that the voice was Sean Connery because it sounded a little bit like Sean Connery trying to. No, 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 it's just some voice guy that did a lot of voices. Yeah, Eric Pullman. But they got the guy who played the guy who played Dent actually in Doctor No is the body of Ernest <laughs> Blofeld, Anthony Dawson, the actor. And you'll get when you get to the making of. There's actually a shot in it when uh, there's lots of like exposition. It's like. It, we're telling you the plot. Here's the plot. Mm -hmm. There's a shot. It's kind of the close up of of Cleb where you see her face, but the background looks a little fuzzy. And it's actually they needed a shot, but they didn't have money to go back. So they literally took a shot that they already shot, zoomed in a little and then had her basically like over herself. Oh, like, OK. It's like a cutout of like a, a frame. And she's actually standing. And I think they actually do it with the other guy, too. They're actually kind of standing in front of themselves. But they needed a background, so they just did it cheap. And it's like, that's the innovation of these movies. And there's also this other weird shot where it actually looks reversed, if you really look at it, where she's like looking at the fish and then walks over and then walks over again. It's like, it starts off as some sort of weird reverse shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's just, they, they cheat a little bit for timing, I guess. And, and also, uh, when, they, when they're telling the plot, when he says, of course they will get their best agent, uh, James Bond, as soon as he starts talking about James Bond, it goes... It, it, it goes nah, 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 nah. Yeah. Like, the music is just right under there as soon as he mentions it yeah and this this is like about revenge isn't it yeah sort for of. killing they mentioned 
for killing Doctor No. I mean, there is a plan because we have our we have our MacGuffin in the movie is called this this thing called the Lector, mm-hmm. which is some kind of a, a deciphering machine that can like um, an Enigma machine or something. I think I think this may be be the beginning of everything we hear about nowadays with regard to algorithms and stuff like that. Maybe this thing can break codes. But, it's just a code breaker. In, That's in the what book, I think. It's a code breaker. In the in the book, it was actually called a Spectre device. The Spectre because, device. Because and here's why. Because and they do mention Smirsh. Smirsh is what they're actually fighting in the books until it gets kind of changed to Spectre. Because like Smirsh is, I think, actually like a Russian agency or something. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 But the, but they wanted to make it. They wanted to make it like some sort of. They didn't want. Up. Yeah, they didn't. Want, they wanted to have a timeless appeal, so they got rid of the. They, or they take took less emphasis on the off yes. the Russians. Probably, maybe I don't know. Maybe they were thinking, hey, maybe eventually the wall is going to come down, and you know the winds of change will be here and all that, and we'll be listening to Scorpion. Change. <laughs> you know. change. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I really, I I gotta say, I mean, like this Rosa Klebb is a really scary chick. I mean, just like a, even though she's like four, four foot nine or something, she's like a really scary. And she shows up at the end, just like in Austin Powers with the who throws a shoe. You know, mm-hmm. she's like a cleaning lady. <laughs> but the idea, but no, what, think, do we, what do we, what do we like? We will seduce Bond with uh, this uh, hot chick that we have. Mm-hmm. Right. They, you know. They're they setting up a, a girl who thinks she is actually working for Russia to entrap him. That's and the to, thing. Yeah, she's innocent. And to get and him man, to steal she... this lector for them. And it gets weird and creepy where it's like when she has her over to tell her what to do. The, the, the puts interview. Her hand on her leg. Yeah. yeah. Puts her hand on her leg and she just sort of. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was definitely. I was like, that's definitely a, a lesbian vibe there that they yeah. were. They just couldn't say it out you, loud. You, you, but... For some reason, you can't say this in movies, but it was plainly spelled out in the books. Like, for example, I brought up oh, um, yeah. Dr. Uh, not Dr. No, Goldfinger. The character of Pussy Galore is is described by Ian Fleming as being a lesbian, but they don't say anything about it in the movie. Oh, uh, yeah. You, you, see, like, you, can, you can't use your charms on me. I'm immune. I'm immune. Yeah. And then, of course, he just he just gets in her face. And, and yeah, like, he work. totally uses his charms on her. And yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, but this is chasing Amy. And then we get to meet... Then she goes off to meet her other partner in this, which is uh, Big Bad Red Grant. Right, right. The great Robert Shaw. Oh, I forgot to mention. D- Daniela Bianchi is Tatiana Romanova. Oh, yeah. well, it's hard to say. She was also in Operation Kid Brother, otherwise known as Operation Double Double O Seven against Neil Connery. <laughs> and her her dialogue was all dubbed over. I found yeah, out yeah dubbed today. by uh, uncredited Barbara Jefford, which she's got kind of like this. It's she's got like a really heavy accent. And I was wondering why she would be overdubbed unless she didn't show up for looping or she doesn't know English that well. I'm guessing she doesn't know English that well. No, or she didn't. I mean, she's Italian, so maybe she didn't sound Russian to them, right? She's not supposed to be so Italian. So they gave her a Russian. Right, right. They have to maybe find you know, someone who could. Boris and Natasha. Accent. Right, right. <laughs> maybe. But this scene I was going to talk about was the one that you love, where we're meeting um, Robert Shaw, and he's uh, he's working out. He's all oiled up on the beach, and she comes and. Oh yeah. <laughs> she wants to see if she's he's tough, so she punches him in the stomach. With the with the with the with the with the knuckle, like she gets like the, the brass knuckles, just jerk. Oh, did and she? Like, I didn't notice that. Yeah, she hit him with brass knuckles, and and when I saw. Okay, you look at his body, and it's like that's what a a weightlifter looked at like at the time. Like this this was the the peak of physical perfection was a was a slightly doughy, blocky man. <laughs> I thought like would you look at weightlifters at the time? Like this is what they look like. They're just big. They're not necessarily super defined. Yeah, that's like, a good way to describe it. He's big, but not defined. He's, I was cracking up because the way he stands, he sticks his rib cage way out. <laughs> oh yeah, he's like sucking. You know, Attention, I run. And it, yeah, it's really hard to um, think that that's the same guy that's um, in in Jaws. That's yeah, Quint. And Quint. I'm trying, yeah. That's only uh, twelve years later. Right. <laughs> Shaw is absolutely amazing because I did not know it was him when I first saw the movie. I was like. Where's Robert Shaw? I saw his name in the credits, and I'm like, oh my goodness, he's Roy Batty apparently in this movie. Yeah, pretty much. He yeah. does look like that. Yeah. He is absolutely frightening and imposing, and I, I seriously think, and if you had a street fight between him and Sean Connery, I think Shaw would eat him alive. Honestly, he's just, he's just so, so big, and you, you don't really get that indication when you're watching Jaws. In Jaws, he seems kind of, I don't know, small. He's done something to himself physically to make him look less imposing. Well, he's older and he's more rickety. He's more rickety, <laughs> rickety, but I think he's he's still a tough guy. But the toughness is in the attitude more than the physical stature in, in that mm-hmm. movie. He's just a really brilliant actor. 
I, I guess he is. He can make himself um, look completely different. Yeah. But he's wonderful in this. And, and also, I mean, like, he's not... The way they describe his character, he's not like a career uh, organized criminal. He's a psychotic maniac who's a murderer. And they just have... They, they hire these people. This is the problem I have with Spectre. It's, a ma- it's, a, it's the biggest problem I have with Spectre is that it doesn't make sense to have this international organized crime business where you have a bunch of crazy people running it and a <laughs> bunch of crazy people on their, you know, on their board of directors, as it were. Yeah, it does seem like that would lead to chaos real quick. But. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, look, I'm, if you remember, I mean, you, ju- you just watched Spectre, so you've seen all of them now. I saw, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their, their room was they, much more impressive in that movie, though. It was this enormous eyes wide shut thing going on. They have that, well, look, if anybody gets out of line, and they even did it in Thunderbolt, anybody gets out of line, they push a button and they go down. I'm just very badly burned. <laughs> thing. Like Will Ferrell. Or, or, or they or, stab you with a knife with head, which has venom on it or something. Or in the case of Spectre, like in, in, in Spectre, the guy just, like, Hanks, Mr. Hanks just comes in and just bashes the guy's head pushes his eyeballs in let's <laughs> yeah. not forget that Ooh. Ew. that was what was that specter right yeah that was the one we just watched except yeah. well i mean it was i mean regan was watching and she she cowered whenever it gets the violence gets too intense but it wasn't exactly blade runner where he crushes his skull no this is pg-13 <laughs> no right so uh so bond goes to istanbul is constantinople Istanbul, and uh, and they're looking for this machine, and and Spectre oh, no, is wait, looking. We gotta go back. We gotta go back because it, oh, he's it, with he, his girlfriend. I forgot. There's yeah, his he's girlfriend. Yeah, with his sort of side piece girlfriend. We, we were see that we never see even, again. That's her last appearance. Yeah, there, there was gonna be a thing, and then it just wasn't. Because you can't be Bond's girlfriend. You can't. Yeah, no. It's just not. Pop- it's never time. gonna work. It's right. never gonna work. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So we go to Istanbul, right? And uh, he hooks up with the with uh, another friend, like Quarrel, who's gonna meet a nasty end, um, Ali Karim Bey, played by Pedro Armendariz, who killed himself four months before this movie was released. Yeah, right after right after he finished, because he knew he was dying, and they actually is that what uh, it was. Yeah, he he knew he got his diagnosis on the set. What was it? And cancer. He, cancer. Uh-huh. And he knew he only had like the doctor said, "Look, you only got like a little while left." And he was already feeling it. That's why, if you look, he's limping through a lot of this. Oh, really? Um, mm-hmm, I didn't. And notice. so what happened was they they shot all his stuff first. He went in. He'd got and then they had him do all his looping that he could. There's actually shots of him where it's not him. It's like a stunt man, like the back of his head or something, or he's walking like far shots and everything. Oh, okay. And then, he knew he was dying. He got all of his affairs in order. He went to the hospital, and then he shot himself. Oh, wow. Well, that's kind of sad. So moving on, he provides him with all this information. He, he takes him around. He gives him the, um, the lay of the land, as it were. They go. There's, a, there's an interesting diversion into a gypsy village where we, we are. Where, uh, where, where there's two girls. To, you're talking about the two women fighting over. The big, the big ex- exploitative cat fight between the, yeah. uh, between the two young women. Oh yeah, and uh, that, let's not that, forget the belly dancer. I like the belly dancer. I could have lived without the cat fight. I think again, these these movies appeal to everyone. If you want cat oh, fighting, if you want if you violence, want if you fighting. want to look at say, a good looking guy, I want to say something before I forget. Now he actually, Karen Bay, his son, the actor's son, actually played the dictator in uh, License to Kill. That dictator that that the you're not talking about Robert Davi, right? Not Robert Davi. The, the the dictator at the end who'd been bought. Like uh, kind of near the it's near the end of the movie, and then the his, the the one Bond girl just kind of goes off with him like a new sponsor. Oh, oh. yes, the one, oh the wow, one that, that was his son. son. That's that his was kid. His, his kid was. That's oh, his, wow. That was his son. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a really great Bond family thing there. Yeah. yeah. Sort of. I mean, if if Dad's story. Because they shot that one in completely in Mexico to save money. Yeah, yeah. So that, he was he was like and he so he was there. Yeah. <clears throat> I had a just a um a off topic discuss uh, question for you because I was asking yeah. Bronwyn. Uh, was Live and Let Die also shot outside of the outside of England, or were there any scenes there? No, I think that was a lot. There was some. Uh, well, there was some stuff in Bahamas. Were there any scenes in in England in that movie? Because, or is it just like well, License okay, to there's, Kill? There's, there's his apartment. There's his apartment. He goes in because when he goes in and he has like the watch. That was. But that, that, was shot that in, could have been shot on a there stage. There was probably New York stuff. I'm gonna guess like the New York stuff was shot in New York. Oh yeah, yeah, know, definitely. Get me a line on a white pimp mobile. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think probably like that big that big sort of set the the sort of the kananga set and everything like the inside mm-hmm. and the cake and anything the anything that's a set can be shot anywhere but yeah. if you if you are specifically out there in cars like you know in piccadilly circus that kind of stuff that would be england but well i guess we'll have to we'll have to watch it again and make sure well we'll be watching these anyway and i gotta well, say when you watch the yeah 
watching this movie again, I, I, I like it a lot more. I like it a lot more than I first watched it. So I, I moved it up a couple of uh no, yeah, that's, I was actually going to say, like watching these movies, when you watch them and you do your you and you and then you go back and you watch them, you know, your list changes. And I like that about these movies. Where it's like you can. <clears throat> yeah, eh, I don't like this more. Oh, I but I do like this one more. It's I think it's, once. It's, it's yeah. Once you've taken the entire uh, catalog into context, mm -hmm. then changes can be made. Yeah, I like. I mean, the first, very first time I saw it, which was before this, I thought it was really a snooze fest. But watching it a little more carefully for seeing some of the details, I actually do like it. That, that's the funny thing is it actually it went down a little for me because of the snooze fest factor of like there's so much plot in here, and I I, I got a little confused even though I've seen this like a multiple times. Doctor No was a little less complicated it was in one place you knew who who was who generally there's a lot going on in this and i got i got a little mixed up and confused even though i've seen it multiple times yeah there is a there is an overly uh, complicated plot thing going on here i put it on the on the list i think I, I believe i put it at number 17 now so it's ahead of a view to a kill but behind doctor because for me i mean like in my in my uh, youth watching these movies the ones that i could really tell you everything about were octopusy and a view to a kill just because mm -hmm. I just I maybe my brain was forming around that time. Well, those are the ones that were on cable around the time that when we yeah, had cable. Yeah, when we had cable yeah. and, and at, in the, at the peak of, of cable of, of or, or or the popularity of it at the time. Well, looking at it now, because it's closer to the formula that we recognize in James Bond movies, we move from location to location. So we're not in yeah. Jamaica this time completely throughout mm -hmm. the movie as we were with Doctor. Although Rose. a lot of the locations are just like, you know, the, 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 the Pinewood back lot and the, the it's just, park. It's, the it's, park. it's filmed in Istanbul and then Pinewood and that's it. Yeah. So all that other stuff you see of Central Europe and all that and behind the Iron Curtain or whatever, Hungary, Yugoslavia, it's all it's all on a train anyway. I mean, because we, we spent half the movie right in Istanbul. Right. It's Constantinople. <laughs> Even old New York was. Once New Amsterdam. Okay, yeah. yeah anyway. <laughs> But we move from, well, oh, okay, the production design, right? They didn't have Ken Adam this time because Ken Adam was working on Dr. Strangelove, but they did a really good job in his place, even though there's not much to comment on once we're on the train because it's a train, right? But there are some really fantastic things, like the, like I said, the Gypsy Village and these underground catacombs. They're amazing. And yeah, I, I, I wonder, is that built? Is Was that built? It could be. I think it's partially location, partially stage, but I just realized as you were saying this, this has a more sort of a naturalistic look to it. It's not the Ken Adam. I mean, even in Dr. No, when he had like no money, it's these weird sets. He's like when the guy goes in to get the spider, you can, it's almost like a web. He goes into this big room. It's like, there's not a lot of that in this. This is more sort of a naturalistic. It like, but I really I love the look of this movie. It has this mm -hmm. wonderful Technicolor thing. And I was I was asking Brahman because we we're talking. About, what would you think if you were seeing like these newer movies, like the Brosnan movies and the and the Craig movies, shot in this style? So much work being put into just all the color. There's so much color. Even when you turn the light out, he, there's a scene. It's nothing. It's you don't even think about it. But he. When he puts, um, when he puts, uh, uh, what's her name, Tatiana to bed because she got her drink got spiked by Robert Shaw, right? He mm -hmm. turns off the light in the compartment and suddenly it's a glow with this blue light, which is supposed to indicate moonlight from outside. And I'm like, I know how they did it. They had like some some small blue lights that would turn on the minute he turned off the the overhead light. It's just a mm -hmm. simple little lighting effect, but it's so astonishing to me. I love well, that kind of kinda, stuff. I just I realized something from. Uh... I think it was Skyfall when there's that that fight in the sort of the Asian building with the lights yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. And the thing. That's what I was thinking of. Uh, I, I was thinking also of the of the um, uh, the siege on the um, on Skyfall itself, where they're trying to protect Judy Dench. The color yeah. and the lighting in there is really wonderful. It's nice and everything, but the thing is, you can do all that with computers. This stuff they had to do. This was handmade. This movie. I mean, oh yeah. You know, and it's just I would love to see movies being made in 2020 that look like that. That's what I want to see. I think we've said all we need to say, and because we now have HD, I don't know if they're are they, are they making these movies in HD now, or are they still using film? Do yeah, you know? uh, uh, Skyfall was actually shot digital. Right, so uh, we have the moved over. Was shot on film. Okay, oh, well, that's interesting. But I would love to see that effect again. I really love the old style of the way Technicolor looked, and a lot of a lot of great stuff like. Hell, well, I mean, you could, Mario you could Bava. Like he made a movie called uh, what was it called? Black Sabbath, I think. It was mm -hmm. beautiful. They do, they do really do a really nice job with the production. I, I caught one of the names. One of the names was familiar to me, but uh, it was not Ken Adam this time. He would come no. back. He'll come back for Goldfinger. He engages with Tatiana, right? We have the catacombs. They spy on the meeting. 
with the little uh, periscope that he has, right? Right. Yeah, the periscope that I I realized when the when the thing eventually when the, when he goes in and they blow it up, I think don't they kind of go in through that hole like where the because like the, when they have to they have to create a situation to get the lector. Right. Yeah. And he he, he actually he says, keeps going up there twice. He's like, is that clock right? And he says, clocks are always right. And uh, whatever. <laughs> Russian clocks are always right. Wait, you skipped the whole thing. You skipped her like before this blowing up thing happens. She sli- you skipped the whole thing where she slips into his bed. Oh right. And they're yeah. filming it. Oh, yeah. That's kind of important. There's All right. Nothing now, there. That's right. That's no, what they meet. Like he, she, he's just there again. Like women just show up at his place. She doesn't have a stitch on. She's under the sheets, and she's got a choker. Yeah, they're yeah, the the just two right And they're yeah, they're filming it, and they show them behind him? the mirror. Well, they're gonna put him. this up on YouTube later. Yeah. There's a. They plan to. Um, I mean, later on when uh, when they when they catch up with them on the train, they basically said they're gonna use the film to to explain why they committed suicide. Which of course, they're that's not what they're gonna do. They're gonna be killed by by red there. But These people are kind of morons. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean. I, I, <laughs> It's like the whole, it goes evil. back to the whole thing of just hiring a bunch of unreliable people. Because, uh, you know, psychotic people can be unreliable, like famously unreliable. But they get together, right? And they get on the train. Are we on the train they now? Get, can we get on the train? Well, you guys were talking about the whole thing where they actually blow up the office and steal the lector. Which, did you notice this clever little thing? He tells her, we're going to do this on the 14th, but they actually do it on the 13th. So even she's caught off on off guard when yeah, they blow everything yeah, up. Yeah, nobody trusts anybody here. <laughs> yeah. Heck, when he meets Robert Shaw on the train and Robert Shaw's pretending to be somebody else, he knows right away something's off. Somehow he tells her the wrong day. Right. And somehow she's in the room with the lector, even though it's the wrong day and the wrong, wrong time. She's there with the lector and he's able to just sort of walk in with her, with the lector, get out. Hmm, that's <laughs> like, true, yeah. That yeah, and they use sense. like a, the, you know, you think this lector is going to be this fancy pants machine or something, but they use like an ordinary Olympia typewriter case to carry it around in. They don't really show what it is. It's kind of more. It's just the like, it's, it's, it's it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just something that both these parties want. You know, they 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 flee. They get on the train with Kareem. Uh, unfortunately, they're being followed. They're getting on the Orient Express. The Orient Express. That's right. Uh, you know, they pretend to be a married couple. Right. David and, and Mrs. and uh, David I've, Somerset. Oh yeah, Good. Yes. and he gives her a, her honeymoon trousseau, and she's so excited about this. Boy, she's really on my nerves at this point. I have to tell you, <laughs> the way she says his name all the time and James, yeah, yeah, James, James, James. <laughs> Horrible things are afoot, basically, uh, especially as uh, Robert Shaw comes on. Now, I read this uh, little factoid that. Robert Shaw came up with the idea of calling him old man, and he improvised it into his lines. But they liked it so much, they decided to keep keep him saying that. And I think the the reason for this is that Connery got annoyed with him for calling him old man. I think I think that's what it was. And basically, <laughs> Robert Shaw is known for antagonizing actors. He likes to screw with actors. He screwed with Richard Dreyfuss constantly on Jaws. Well, also, isn't the huh. whole point? Like, it can, uh, it can honestly, it can help the performance if you're supposed to be someone that annoys this person, and you start actually doing annoying Absolutely, things. Absolutely, like, yeah. It they just sort of like have that that they'll have that twitch in the eye of like this this guy. Yeah. <laughs> They kill uh, they kill Kareem Bay. Bond gets to Kareem Bay's son, asks for the contact that he's gonna have on the train, but I wonder what happened then with Kareem Bay's son because Robert Shaw's right there. He's already there, he's on the train, then he pretend and pretends he impersonates this person that James Bond is supposed to be meeting. And there's this great shot. Oh, this this whole thing is very Hitchcockian too. There's this great shot where Robert Shaw's following James on um he's on the train following him while James is on the platform. And you can see them, and they keep having these these um, these orchestral stings, just like the tarantula scene in Doctor No. Mm-hmm. Every time you see Shaw's face, you hear you see you hear this, and then you see him again, yeah. you know, and it just keeps doing that. And it's it's a really it's, awesome, and the whole thing has a Hitchcockian vibe to it. Yeah, it's, it's very suspenseful. Great suspense because we know because what he we know, know who he is, yeah. and we're not sure if James Bond knows, but we know James Bond knows something's wrong. And they all have dinner, right? And I guess it was the red wine. It was the red wine when Robert Shaw said. He had red wine with fish. He had red wine with fish, and every red-blooded American and a person of the UK knows that you don't. I just, when the first time to to knock knock her out, like he puts something in her drink that she drinks, and he sees him doing it. And then when he tells him what he did, he said he put in uh, chloral hydrate. Right. And I realized that's actually what was used on James Bond in Living Daylights when she's like... uh, when uh, Dabo wants to like, like some, somebody's trying to drug him and he, and he he drinks and then he gets all wobbly and then he looks at her and he goes chloral hydrate. <laughs> oh yes, that's right. Oh wow. She puts in his drink. Right. Uh, it says it like Timothy does chloral hydrate. 
<laughs> oh, so that's a callback to that. It could be. Which sort of uh, continues with my idea that the whole thing is just sort of the way I see James Bond. I do not see these movies in any kind of existing continuity. I see them as as that James Bond is a character that people take because they kind of they kind of say that in uh, what was the uh, Skyfall that these people have real names, right? So I'm thinking maybe. I know. Wait a minute now. Well, I, I know. I know. I know. It's a controversial point, and you're probably going to chew my head off for this. But I'm is it well, possible okay, that James Bond is a character and not a real person? James Bond is not a code. James Bond. This has been this has been debunked many times. Just watch for your eyes only. One of your favorites. Mm-hmm. He's, he's got the you know spoiler alert. His wife dies. Right. He's put down roses on her grave. Yeah. Yeah. At the beginning of that a, movie, yeah. also. In Spy Who Loved Me, Mrs. Ringo Starr mentioned something about his... She mentions, his, yeah, that he was married. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, I, I know. Months. I know about that. Those were the two times it acknowledges that this is the same... Ca- the well, same. Then that's enough for me. But <laughs> what, what, how do you explain, like, Javier Bardem having a real name? I mean, they, they kind of, like, have, like, what's your real name? Mm. I mean, they, they say that that's twice, cool. I think, in the movie, as though these agents don't... That even their agent names aren't their real names or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll get to that when we get to that. But... Uh, yeah. But I saw a video that uh, I think it was IGN put out, and they were trying to say that all the events of, say, Spectre and Skyfall and all that stuff happened before the events of Goldfinger. And I'm like, I don't know about that. That just doesn't seem right. Well, there, there is a theory that basically everything that happens to James Bond happens. Uh, y- you go, you go uh, Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace. Then you take a break. Then, then you have all the rest of the James Bond movies then you have Skyfall because then because Skyfall is all like he's he is old man and he's like has to he's like has to get back he gets to get his magic back, so it's like every you could say the continuity starts with the first two then does all from Sean Connery all through to the end, then it picks up at Skyfall. Okay, gotcha. So you're saying Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, then everything up until Skyfall. Yeah. Okay. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Well, we'll yeah, see. I mean, that's, that's uh, why not? Why not? Why not? I, Fine, I'll, I'll go with that. It is just a movie. Yeah, it is can, just a movie. I, I can know. just take these as they are. I don't, I don't really need all that, but okay. <laughs> uh, so with the action on the train, we get a lot of suspense, a lot of great fight stuff going on. Old man, you know, and even Connery gets to work in an old man, old man, and oh, all, all the gags that um, Desmond Llewellyn's Q gives him, like the exploding briefcase, finally goes off. I the first time we watched the movie, I had to go use the bathroom, so I missed that, and then I got to see it again. So. It <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the best scene, and you left. <laughs> Reminiscent of the of the pen that you like the the golden eye pen, <laughs> like the like how many times does he do it? How many times does he oh, do yes. it? Oh yes, like, the clicking. He doesn't know. Like you're supposed to turn it and do the thing. Right. And the thing it's very sort of OCD of like you have to turn it and then you have to do this and you have to do <laughs> that and you can open it. So do they it. fight. Robert Shaw loses, and he gets um he gets Titania off the train. And he meets up with what would have been Robert Shaw's contact. Who was another moron. Well, so yeah, think, obviously. Oh, he lays her in a, in a bed of flowers in the back of the truck. Um, to sleep off her drugging. And then some more morons show up in a helicopter trying to throw grenades at him because they're morons. And he manages to, to pick off the guy throwing the grenade. And the grenade gets, of course, gets thrown back into the helicopter. And, and, the helicopter and through all this, up. they recycle music from Dr. No, if you That's notice. That's right, like, yeah. Um, uh, but they also, there is another theme that I kept doing that kept bugging Regan. I kept going bum 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 <laughs> bum yeah, bum 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 That's a John <laughs> Barry. It's called. It's not the James Bond theme. It's his own version. It's his. It's his own stamp on the material. It's called 007. That's what it is. That's, that's so nice. That's called mm-hmm. double, and it is. Re, it is reused. It's reused in, various, in a bunch of movies. In about like two or three movies. Usually in action sequences, you know, running, mm-hmm. driving, bum 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 bum. And uh, yep. so we blow up the helicopter, and everybody's well. They, and then we then we have a boat chase. So one chase leads into another chase, which leads into another chase, which is a Bond staple. This is how I, you know. I, I think I think they would it would it would become like absolutely solidified with Live and Let Die, with that enormous chase scene that they have across the bayous and all that. And mm-hmm. it's just it goes on forever and ever. But this is sort of like the first version of that big epic chase that we would start to see in later Bond films. What do you think? If, if, yeah. If, if, a, if a couple of stuntmen get like very badly burnt, very badly burnt, <laughs> then Bad, so be okay. it. Because I do think that like on the making of this, like, yeah, one guy he kind of like so got burnt yeah. Up Walter Gotell is 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 chasing them in boats, and he thinks they're going to surrender. And of course, you know, again, 
it's cheap evil labor labor you get what you pay for basically <laughs> mm-hmm. he he they shoot all his gas tanks he just pushes them out and lights a flare gun and sets off this enormous big explosion and it causes all kinds of havoc for for the specter people no wait a minute no wait a minute you're you forgot the the bat the little last bit where Elsa Club comes in. Oh, oh yes. yeah, yeah, How yeah. Did you Who it? throws a shoe? Honestly, <laughs> I mean she comes in. Okay, this well, is no really... because before they show her, there she's speaking to um, Blofeld and the guy who set up this plan is speaking to Blofeld about its miserable failure. And they show the evil shoe with the poison on the, the tip. Evil the demonstration. <laughs> the man with one evil shoe. He demonstrates the evil shoe, and then she takes the evil shoe with her when she goes to uh, confront. That's right. Bonding he kills. Effect. He kills number five. While well, Walter Gotel comes in with the evil shoe, and uh, and then we have the boat chase, though, right? We had the boat chase after that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we go into, and then they have their little hotel room or whatever, and they act like they're going to be a couple forever. But we know she's she's history. Right. She's going to go off and become well, a no, writer, a or she's going to find herself become a hippie. There's a little tension in that scene because she because when um the what's the woman's name the Rosa short Clark. one when she comes in. Rosa. She's she thinks, you know, they're supposed to be working together. The two women are supposed to be working together. But obviously, and she she doesn't say anything to James. Now, why doesn't she say anything to James? Oh, James, James, that girl is evil over there. You know, something like that. Is he pointing a gun at her or something by then? Not um, Not until she's they they make eye contact. And then and then what's her name? Rosa there puts her finger to her lips and says, shut up, you know, basically. And James has his back turned during this whole time. Mm. But she, so, but Titania's conflicted. Is she going to go along with it? Or, because she likes James Bond better than she likes being. No, no, no. But Russian, conflicted huh? means that she feels oh, she still mean... has to work for Mother Russia, or she thinks she is. Yeah, I mean, she probably feels conflicted that she's she was supposed to be doing a job for Mother Russia, but now she's staying with this guy. So she doesn't uh, she doesn't move to help him right away. She lets her get it's all. Not, she gets uh, even even the, even the, the worst the girlfriend I ever had in my life would have warned me. <laughs> is what I'm saying. They would have said, uh, "Dave, uh, t- 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 a bad, bad person over there." But, but bad. Yeah, but she's got Hunt, a shoe. He isn't even surprised. They they meet eyes, and he just looks at her, like so irritated. Like. And it was kind of funny too, because when she starts advancing toward James with her with her little blade sticking out of her shoe, she's kind of walking awkwardly, you know, because it's really hard to walk with that thing, I guess. Yeah. Well, and then she starts doing like the, this sort of weird sort of thing with her. She's like digging at him with the foot, like she's trying to like she's like kicking at him and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's maybe not. It's a bit of a design flaw. Yeah, it is. Actually, this would have been the situation where maybe you do throw the shoe because if she took the shoe off and then That's like right. threw it right. at if she were random tasks, she could have thrown that shoe or or odd job or, or somebody like that could have thrown the shoe and slit his throat. Slit his just throat. Hit, and you just need to hit him with the poison. It works just a little bit. Seconds. Just a little. Dab. Right. It's... Just poke him with a pen or a pen. How about a pen? How about a pen with a poisonous venom dart or something on it? Why a shoe? That would have been way more practical. You're absolutely Maybe if right. she was a dancer or a ballerina, she could have done a little arabesque and sliced them open. With right. That thing. But um, but no. Instead, it, it just sort of it ends like that. And, you know, they're on the boat and everything or whatever. And we hear the theme song from Russia with love. From Russia with love. Yeah. Very Sinatra. He's got, the, he's got that film in his hand. Where did he get that piece of film? I'm trying to think of where, where did that he get that be. piece He took of film? it from Robert Shaw on the train. He took the. Oh, okay. That's the yeah. dirty film of them. So that's the dirty film. Yeah. yeah but he's, well, you know, the thing is, like, he could he have eBayed it and gotten thousands. Uh, <laughs> he says something to like she asks him a question and he did, it's like. It's something dirty was said there and then cut out, and I'll never know what it was. But he, she says something to him, and he goes, "Oh yeah." And then there's like this cut, and then they go <laughs> and then they start kissing, and then it's up. I, oh, he waves goodbye to the it. film too. But the problem is, the film is still fine. Throwing it in the water is 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 not going to do anything because uh, it's it's not even going to corrode the film. It's oh, it's right. going to be lying at the bottom of the water until somebody picks it up. Probably Quint. Later on, when he's doing some shark fishing or whatever, and he's going to find that film, and he's going to be like, <laughs> "You killed my blonde clone, old man." <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, I, I, I really, I enjoyed this movie, James. Bond. Oh, uh, we get a little thing there where it says James Bond will. Re- oh, not quite the end. It says not quite the end. Not quite, <laughs> the, quite end. the end. James Bond will return in Goldfinger. He loves gold, <laughs> oh, no. only gold. Uh-oh. Thank you. But this guy, uh, Matt Monroe, I was like. Listening to a song, I was like, that guy sounds like Frankie. I mean, he sounds just like Frank Sinatra. Well, this would have been the prime Frank Sinatra ripoff time, wouldn't it? Have been? Yes, it would have, but yeah. Sinatra would have never have agreed. Sinatra was very picky about the, the projects that he was asked to participate in. 
He was a busy man. He was a he was the hardest working man in show business before James Brown. Yeah, it's, I feel the same way I did about as I did about Doctor No. It's a much more, it's much more chill. James Bond. It's not, uh, it's not the nonstop action that we get later. But but I did enjoy it. He's uh, still violent and he hits a woman though. He does. That's true. He does smack her. But she's for, from his point of view, she's like a liar and a double spy. It's not like I don't know. I have nothing more also, to say about that. Okay. Well, Sean Connery would, was prone to smacking women in his personal life, really like That's the story. rumor, yeah. Well, no, he didn't actually say it. He just said, there's nothing wrong with defending yourself if a woman hits you or something. It wasn't It wasn't like, I go knocking around beauties all the time, and I like to see them bleed. You know, <laughs> yeah, he wasn't he saying still, that. He still regretted saying it, and he had to, like... Roger Moore had no problem with, like... Or actually, I was just thinking, like, he didn't have a problem with it either, of, like, taking the arm and... He, he, behind believe, the back. Did he slap Jane Seymour? No, I don't think so. My did man. he slap anybody? I don't I remember. When, you know, when we I don't know why, movies, but I'm we'll, uh... I'm just remembering just the brutality of Connery's character more than anything. And also, well, Craig is fairly brutal, and so is Dalton. But for some reason, I don't know. It, it, Connery's very hulking. And it's part of this trivia that I included in the previous episode we did, is that the sets were built to be a little bit smaller to make Connery look even bigger. So they wanted him to make make him look even bigger and more menacing. He's about 6'2". Mm-hmm. They would make him probably look 6'4", or 6'5", or something. And and it's true, because even in the in the train set, I don't know if that was a built set or not, but the thing is, those two guys really look enormous in that train compared to anyone they else. They do. That's true. But uh, I, I, I did enjoy the movie a lot better the second go-round watching it. It was a lot of fun. It's the, uh, We were talking about Bond movies that took place on trains. This one... The majority of the screen time is on a train, but there are two other instances of them being on a train, right? One was uh, one of the more recent ones, Spectre, was it? Mm-hmm. They're on the train, yes. Inspector. Um, and then I said they're also in The Spy Who Loved Me. There's a train sequence. There's a train sequence in Spy Who Loved Me. And a brief one at the end of Live and Let Die. There's probably more, but those were the ones that came to top of mind. But this is like the major time that you see most of the action on a train. Right. Which, I mean, like, if they if they don't have Ken Adam, it's you're not going to have a big layer for them to escape from or a slow, unnecessarily slow dipping mechanism <laughs> or anything like that. Or sharks That's with freaking true. laser there's beams. There's no villainous layer in this. That's there's true. only the train, basically. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, like, there's there's Blofeld's office, which is on a boat. Yeah. But the, I mean, the only thing weird about that is the fish. The, the fish and the kitty cat, too. There's a kitty cat. And he feeds one of the fish to the cat, which I thought was really cool as well. But the cat eats it. And I'm like, my cats wouldn't do that. My cats would not just eat the fish if I gave them a live fish out of a tank. They would want to play with it for a little while, you know? Yeah, that's Drop true. Drop off at your foot. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they wouldn't look just, what I did. What do you get? I mean, I gave um, I gave sushi some, uh, and yes, a cat named Sushi. I gave Sushi some, some filet of something in a fancy feast thing. She kind of looked at it for a little while, then realized it was food, but she's kind of slow. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's okay. Like, again, we're going, we're going in. I'm going in trying to go in fresh. And I think I was more pleasantly surprised by Dr. No and how involved I got. And then I watched this and I got a little bit confused. So right now it's just right behind Dr. No. Like I'm starting over fresh with my list as, as we do this. So it goes a little b- below Dr. No, but I did, I did enjoy it. And I really, you know, I enjoy these movies a lot. Like people have said this before. It's like the worst James Bond movie is better than a lot of, like really good movie. Yeah. That's so true. what do you, what do you think of Connery? I like him. I like his performance. Um, I appreciate the fact that he still has his hair, uh, even though it is kind of painted in by now. <laughs> and, uh, I, I enjoy his performance. I mean, you really, when you think about like the amount of acting he'd done before he did these movies and he, they cranked these things out quick. Like you, you said about, last like, time you said four movies in four years, right? He's, you know, he's, he's there. He's already complete. I, even in Dr. No, it's like, he's, already you can just like some actors they just have it and he has it and it's like you can't fake it yeah and he has it this is and true. i appreciate that that's why it's going to be really tough to replace craig i think <laughs> <laughs> it is i would say i would say he's probably the best actor like my, my theory my my thoughts are craig is the best actor connery is the best bond uh, but Connery's the best Bond, but my favorite is probably Roger Moore, even though he's not a really he's good at playing Roger Moore. <laughs> he's and, well, Craig. Craig is more method, I think. I think Craig is definitely a method kind of a guy, you know. He, yeah, he gets more in with the character of you know. I would suggest well, let's, as ask, you're watching, let's ask the actress. What do you think? 
about Daniel Craig's acting? Yeah, he seems to be taking it very seriously. He's very intense with the whole thing. But, I mean, I would say he also gives he gives James Bond a more of a, a naive kind of thing underneath everything, all of the like horrible Lazenby, thing that he's though. doing. Like Lazenby, and that's, that was my problem with Lazenby. Yeah, he wasn't an actor. He was a, he was a male he was model. A model yeah. did like a couple of commercials and for, for what he was so asked was to do. It was extraordinarily... Damn, sexy man. That's what he was. But I mean, Sean Connery has everything that you would want for this part to have. He's athletic. He seems smart. He's, he's incredibly hairy. He, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but I mean, he ha- has all the expected characteristics that you would want a super spy to have. Right. It's always, I've noticed in his performance, every time he's walking, he's looking around. He's doing, a, he's doing, he's, he's intentional. He's kind of looking around like, is anybody going to kill me today? Like he's. He's got this, like, he's always kind of, like, looking in his environment, taking his environment in. He's not just sort of just hanging out, like, you know, I'm impervious. He's, he's always kind of got that eye, like, you know, somebody could jump out of a thing, and then they usually do, and then he's ready for it. Next time, we'll be joined by John Fralick, and we'll be discussing Goldfinger. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Istanbul was Constantinople, now it's Istanbul, and Constantinople, been a long time gone, Constantinople, why did Constantinople get the works? That's cool, but is this about the Turks? No, you can't go back to Constantinople. Been a long time gone. Constantinople, why did Constantinople get the works? That's nobody's business but the Turks. Istanbul.